Dear colleagues, good afternoon. I would like to welcome all those that are here for this reading and those that are uh, here. Uh, today is a special day for us since uh, we do have uh, once again uh, Professor uh, David Hipponito, uh, who has honored us many times being here and giving excellent talks. So, uh, uh, Professor Hipponito is from uh, is Professor of Radiology in Monza, Milan. Actually, his special interest, as you know, is uh, abdominal imaging. And he, he's a constant speaker at uh, Esther meetings, and uh, he has become a good friend as well of our department. So, I would like to thank you once again. And he's uh, generous enough to give two talks every time. Yeah. So, today we have Two majors. Uh, the one is uh, the imaging of primary sclerosis in collagenitis, whatever radiologists should be called. And the second one is the radiological imaging of gastroenterophagiatic nets, neuroendocrine So thank you once, once again, David, and uh, we are on you. Thank you, Mr. Bolli, and uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you again, Professor Prasopoulos and Professor Atidakis. For this new invitation and this beautiful uh, hospital and the university and i'll try today to share with you our experience and uh, uh, the radiological needs in two really hot topics at least in our hospital that uh, as already you said is the primary sclerosis in cholangitis and the neuroendocrine tumor but uh, just to not waste your time i think that we could start if you are ready okay uh, i can put in a Presenter mode. Yeah, do you need presenter mode? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. No, just a moment. Yes, no problem. Okay, I think we, we can start. Let's define what primary sclerosis cholangitis is. First of all, it's a rare immune mediated chronic liver disease where both the intrahepatic and the extra hepatic bile ducts become inflamed and damaged, developing the so called strictures that reduce and obstruct the flow of the bile out of the liver. Usually, the term sclerosis or sclerosis refers to the stiffening and hardening of the bile ducts while the term cholangitis refers to the inflammation of the bile duct. Obviously, that the chronic uh, bile duct obstruction and inflammation leads, you have to do something, okay? leads to liver inflammation, uh, leads to the fibrotic evolution of the parenchyma till reaching the so-called end liver damage, also known as cirrhosis. Well, this uh, kind of disease is more typical of young patients and in most of the cases is more typical for the male sex. And don't forget that it's associated with inflammatory bowel disease up to 80% of the cases, especially with uh, ulcerative colitis. In fact, in most of the cases, the primary sclerosis in chronitis is an incidental lesion because we discovered it in an asymptomatic patient during a routine examination for the inflammatory bowel disease. And for this reason, from clinical point of view, we have two different manifestations. The subclinical primary sclerosing cholangitis, in which we have only the abnormal liver chemistry in a polystatic pattern, and we have those patients with advanced disease that may manifest with abdominal pain, jaundice, pruritus, and fatigue. Well, while regarding the morphological point of view, uh, looking at the images, we have a different pattern of manifestation of disease that are represented by the large duct disease, that is the most frequent one in almost 90% of patients, in which we have the combination of cholestatic liver pattern biochemistry with several biliary structures associated or not with the biliary dilation and are clearly recognizable on cholangiographic study like MRCP or ERCP. We have also the small duct disease that is uh, less, less frequent and usually we have a normal bile duct morphology at the cholangiographic study and so we can do the correct diagnosis only through the biopsy or through the endoscopic examination. 
And finally, in most of in some of the cases, the primary sclerosis and cholangitis could be associated with autoimmune hepatitis. In these cases, again, we need some information that are strictly related to the autoimmune disease, and so we deserve uh, the biopsy of the bile ducts. How can we do the diagnosis? As we already said, first, the biochemistry, because the patient has an elevated cholestatic serum marker. Then we can move to the imaging, in which the magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography and endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography have both an important role in making the correct diagnosis. And finally, the biopsy that usually still be used only in those patients with small duct disease or with autoimmune hepatitis. Well, regarding the diagnostic technique that we could be used in everyday clinical practice, we can take the advantage of ultrasound examination, even if it could be used only on the first uh, stage of disease. Computer tomography, that is more important, especially in the emergency department, just to highlight any possible complication of uh, liver disease, like the abscess, angiocarcinoma, ascites, and so on. We will have another technique that is not radiological from point of view, that is the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. And finally, the most important one is the magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. That is the best non-invasive technique to make the correct diagnosis. So let's start with the ultrasound. Usually we do not have any specific findings. And for this reason, we use this technique like a screening test just to check the anatomy of the biliary tree, just to taste, to taste and to evaluate the liver stiffness through the uh, ultrasound elastography. And the only uh, features that can be highlighted with ultrasound examination are the segmental biliary duct dilation. So we can make the diagnosis only in advanced stage. Moreover, don't forget that the ultrasound is uh, operator dependent. So uh, the experience of the radiology is uh, really important. In most of the cases, we, are, uh, we may have some difficult in making the correct diagnosis and in distinguishing stones from uh, intraluminal sludge. We could use also the tomography uh, computer scan examination. But uh, as already said, in most of the cases, we use it only in the emergency uh, condition or just to exclude other causes of uh, biliary three uh, stenosis and alteration of the, of the biochemistry. And how we should perform the CT scan, usually we suggest a, a multi-phasic contrastographic approach starting from the unannounced CT, because it's really important to highlight the presence of stone uh, or lithiasis along uh, the intrahepatic uh, biliary tree. The arterial phase, sorry, okay. While the arterial phase is more important just to highlight the inflammation of uh, hepatic parenchyma, that is quite typically, especially during the relapse of the disease, so during the acute phase of primary sclerosis and cholangitis, while the portal venous phase is the most important one to highlight the dilation of the intrahepatic biliary tree. It allows us also to recognize the cirrhotic evolution of liver parenchyma and the retraction of capsule. And in axial plane, we are able also to recognize the different stenosis, stenosis and dilation of biliary tree, the peribiliary tree edema, and in the worst case, the possible presence of cholangiocarcinoma lesion that are well described and defined when we perform the delayed phase imaging. Let's move to the summarizing the uh, pro and cons of CT scan. For sure, uh, this technique is more efficient in the advanced stage of disease because it's are able to recognize both stenosis and dilation. This technique is not useful to recognize the primary sclerosis and cholangitis that involve only the small ducts. And the limitation, obviously, is represented by the exposure to radiation dose. In some cases, the dilation is not so typical for primary sclerosis and cholangitis. For this reason, in most of cases, we deserve 
the MRCP study that according to the EAS uh, guidelines and with the new ESGAR guidelines should be considered the first diagnostic imaging modalities in patients with primary sclerosing pharyngitis. Why is the most important one? Because first, it's a non-invasive technique. Obviously, it does not exposure the patient to any radiation dose and may offer the correct evaluation of the entire biliary tree due to the fluid content, but the, this technique offers information also regarding some uh, extra biliary tree findings like the parenchyma liver changes or the pancreas liver changes and splenomegaly as well. And since most of these patients are quite young, they need a longer follow-up during the history. And for this reason, again, we should prefer the MRI to other techniques. And again, the international guidelines suggest that the liver biopsy is no longer routinely recommended to confirm the diagnosis of PSC, except in a small duct disease. In other cases, the MR is enough to make the correct diagnosis. How we could perform a correct MRI protocol? For sure, the first important thing is the fasted state with a range from four hours to six hours before the examination. In most of the cases, we suggest to uh, use a negative oral contrast agent like the pineapple juice or blueberry juice in order to reduce the hyper intensity of the stomach due to the fluid content. And regarding the protocol, we suggested a really standardized protocol that should start with the typical T2 weighted radial MRCP sequences that allow us to have an overall overview of the entire biliary tree, so to recognize immediately the presence of stenosis and the biliary dilation. But for sure, the most important things and most important sequences are the three dimensional MRCP sequences, because since they are really tiny uh, slice, they allow us to better recognize the stenosis, to measure them, and they allow us, allow us also to have a multi-angle visualization of the different uh, possible localization of primary sclerosing cholangitis. The T1 sequences should be performed both in phase and out of phase. And the aim of these sequences is first to recognize the standard anatomy of the abdominal organ. Secondly, they should rule out the presence of steatosis that is quite common in those patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis. And finally, they are really helpful in differentiating the stones from neomobilia. Don't forget that the stones in patients with the primary sclerosing cholangitis are usually hyper-intense on T1 and not hyper-intense like the other stones in other clinical condition. And usually the pneumobilia is hyper-intense both in T1 and T2, and it has a typical long uh, linear appearance. Let's move to the T2-weighted sequences in the axial plane. They are really useful to recognize the typical peripiliary edema in light with inflammation of the biliary tree, but the sequences are able also to recognize the parenchymal inflammation in which we are able to recognize a wedge-shaped area characterized by hyperintensity of T2 and special hyperintensity if compared to surrounding parenchyma. During the cirrhotic evolution, the patient may develop also fibrosis. And again, in T2-weighted sequences, we are able to recognize the collagen deposition with the, uh, through this linear hyperintensity area on T2-weighted images, usually located in subcapsular space, and in most of the cases associated with the retraction of the capsule. Diffusion-weighted sequences has a main role, especially in those patients that do not undergo contrast agent administration, and they are really useful, like the T2-weighted sequences in recognizing the inflammation and the liver fibrosis, but are also really useful in recognizing the focal liver lesion that may develop in those kind of patients and those settings of disease. Finally, if you want, you can use the contrast agent to uh, improve uh, the diagnostic performance of the cholangiopancreatographic study. The unenhanced 
and MR scan are usable to recognize the hyperintensity of the biliary sludge and of stones, while the arterial phase is really useful to recognize the area of inflammation inside the liver parenchyma, and maybe also the typical targetoid appearance of cholangiocarcinoma. In portal venous phase, we can offer information regarding the biliary tree dilation, the stenosis. We are able to recognize also the thickening of the periberial rectal wall, and please pay attention to the round uh, area of enhancement that could be in line with the diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma lesion. Finally, if you use an hepatobiliary contrast agent, you can obtain also other information defined as functional information because we are able to recognize those biliary three that has a normal excretion of contrast agent if compared with those areas that do not excrete the contrast. So it means that this area deserves an endoscopic approach, while the right side of the liver, in this case, is excreting in a normal way the amount, the contrast agent that we administered. Moreover, the hepatobiliary contrast agent is able also to offer information regarding the area of liver parenchyma that does not work correctly, like in this example, on the right side of the liver and along the second segment of the liver. So, <coughs> sorry, the contrast agent, the hepatobiliary contrast agent is really useful to assess the, fu the function of liver parenchyma and biliary tree as well. But how we should write our report? I suggested to split the report into different parts. First one could be dedicated to the biliary tree findings, and the second one to the liver findings. Well, let's start with the biliary findings. What we should highlight first, we should find out and rule out the presence of the biliary strictures that can be present or not, according to the large duct morphology or small duct morphology. Obviously, the stenosis may be single or can be multiple, like in this case, and can be both extrahepatic or intrahepatic, and in some cases can be combined with biliary dilation. When we uh, find a stenosis, we should localize it, and we should use two specific terms in order to understand the degree of severity of the strictures. And so we can use the terms low grade, that mean reduction or narrowing of the lumen less than 75% of caliber, or we, choose an, or we choose another term that is high-grade stenosis, that means a narrowing of the lumen higher than 75%. This term are quite, quite in line with the terms used in the ERCP procedures represented by the terms dominant strictures. When we find, again, the stenosis, we should measure the longest stenosis in coronal plane, and we should measure the length of the most severe strictures. The biliary dilation can be present or not. It depends on the stage of the disease. But we should use two different terms, biliary dilation and biliary succulation. Succulation means dilation of the intrahepatic biliary tree with a caliper of at least 10 millimeters. And finally, looking uh, at the contrastographic phase or the diffusion weighted sequences, we should look at the biliary wall in order to evaluate any possible enhancement. And we should highlight uh, this pattern when the thickening is higher than two millimeters. And again, don't forget to highlight any possible rounding nodular area in line with the diagnosis of, of uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Finally, when we look at the biliary tree, in most of the cases, the patient presents some stones inside the biliary tree. And as already said, they usually are hyperintense on T1 weighted sequences and hypointense on T2 weighted sequences. Moreover, in the literature, we have two different uh, morphologic patterns that uh, can be described and are represented by the so-called beaded appearance, that means presence of stenosis and dilation, 
quite alternate one between, between the other one. And in the advanced stage, we have the so uh, a specific pattern that is called the prune tree appearance that refers to the presence of multiple peripheral obliteration with reduced arborization of the PRA3 that looks like a prune tree. Let's move to the liver findings. When we look at the liver parenchyma, first we should look at the intensity of the liver parenchyma, especially on T2 weighted sequences, because we, we must analyze the area of hyperintensity in line with inflammation, so with the activity of the disease or presence of uh, fibrotic alteration along with the sub uh, uh, on the periphery of the hepatic lobe. Since the patient may have in advanced stage a cirrhotic evolution, again, we should highlight the typical findings of that disease that are represented by hypertrophy of the first segment and hypotrophy of the right side of the liver segment. This behavior and this pattern is totally different from cirrhosis derived from HPV infection or from H, uh, HCV infection, because in this case, the liver has a smooth uh, age, smooth shape, there are um, and not irregular shape that are more typical of HCV infection. And again, the hypertrophy, the massive hypertrophy of the first segment is quite typical of primary sclerosing cholangitis. Finally, when we use the contrast agent, we should look at the area of uh, uh, altered enhancement in line with the phlogistic phenomenon. Uh, we should recognize the enhancement, the irregular enhancement of the different segment, retraction of capsule, and hypo functioning area when we use the hepatobiliary contrast agent. In this case, we could appreciate the, uh, the delayed enhancement of the fibrotic tissue along all the biliary tree. We should not look only at the liver, but we should look also outside from the liver or some complication derived from cirrhosis, like the portal hypertension, the splenomegaly, development of ascites and the portosystemic collaterals. While the portal lymphadenopathy is not so quite common in primary sclerosing cholangitis, but they are more common in primary biliary cirrhosis. The gallbladder should be analyzed at all of the time because in most of the patient is hydropic, so it's really enlarged. And again, when we analyze the gallbladder, don't forget to rule out the presence of gallbladder carcinoma. And finally, please write in the report the appearance of pancreas, especially we should highlight the presence of lobulation or not because in most of cases, the patient has a sausage appearance with a very smooth uh, and losing of lobulation in line with autoimmune pancreatitis. Unfortunately, the primary sclerosing cholangitis uh, may be prone to development of several complications. And from those, the most important one is the cholangiocarcinoma lesion that may develop in a range from 10 to 20% of cases. But we should have also other different kinds of focal liver lesion, maybe due to a bacterial infection, like the abscess. And these patients are prone also to developing some uh, neoplastic lesion outside from the liver, represented by the colorectal cancer, because this patient has a strictly relationship with uh, ulcerative colitis. Regarding the cholangiocarcinoma, that is one of the most important complications of primary sclerosing cholangitis, don't forget that the typical form is the peri island form and not the massive form, the mass forming form. And when we find out any cholangiocarcinoma lesion, we should write uh, the maximum axial diameter of the lesion. The relationship, the relationship with portal vein and the arterial structures, and most important, we should offer the classification according to the Klaskin classification, just to offer uh, some uh, tips to the surgeon and decide if the surgical approach could be possible or not. When we are in front of cholangiocarcinoma, 
we should rule out the presence of some metastasis in surrounding liver parenchyma and some neoplastic localization in the lymph nodes. Finally, again, don't forget that in case of cholangiocarcinoma lesion, the patient may have also a peritoneal dissemination of neoplastic condition through the ascites or to the thickening of the peritone. Well, since the primary sclerosing cholangitis is a disease characterized by a long history with remission and relapse, the patient deserves a long follow-up study that must be done again through MRI because the patients are really young. And what we have to write in the follow-up study, the same things, more or less, so first, the BI strictures, because they can be stable or they can be worsening a lot of, uh, a lot of the time. They can be increased in number. They can cause upstream dilatation. And again, we also to write information regarding the thickening of the bile duct wall, because some patients after the therapy can, uh, can uh, achieve a recovering of disease. We should look at the parenchymal changes, especially the inflammation or morphological modification uh, along the development in cirrhotic pattern. Portal hypertension is really mandatory in this patient. And again, the focal liver lesion may develop along with the follow-up. Finally, if you use an hepatobiliary phase, you are able to highlight those functioning area and those functioning biliary tree in comparison to the uh, standard one. And so we can suggest to endoscopy, uh, to endoscopist, the physician, which BR3 must be treated in order to cure the patient and modify the status of the healthcare of patient. And I hope that at the end of this year, through the ESGAR, we will offer you the new guidelines regarding the approach and uh, to write the court report in this kind of uh, pathological condition. And thank you for this part. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. You have covered every aspect of the disease. And although it's not a common disease, however, it's, it's a very difficult to manage. Of course, the, the high prevalence of the genome is a major problem, but the only problem in those cases. I remember a case uh, many years ago where Professor Vedelet is uh, dealing with such a, such, a, such a patient with many strictures and many stones. I, I don't remember how many strictures. If he tried to, uh, uh, to remove each one of the stones by using the polarioscope at that time, it was something new. But uh, uh, 35 years ago, or 30 years ago, and it's so difficult to, 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 to offer something to this to these guys. So this guy is not a uh, hologic carcinoma, but he has the stones. It's, it's like the same because the liver was damaged uh, every 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 month or every year. So it's 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 a, it's a significant issue. Uh, I, I saw that in the. The, the extra reading, there was a lot of uh, interest about cholangitis, right here in secondary, and the end of cholangitis carcinoma for, for obvious reasons. So you have to cover everything, not only the basic. And, and thank you, uh, since you have presented the, the, not only the complication, but the liver, the, uh, the, the involvement of the liver in such a case, which is, which finally is, is the, the, the final problem. Then, uh, not so frequently, but uh, 
fast, they ask us great because we didn't know what to do. So, primary project is it's a quantum equation. There's no result, it's the opposite. Of course, it's a problem. So, so, we should avoid any blunders in the virtual administration. That's why it's very important to have the diagnosis. So, we personally, a very special when you are in such inflammatory uh, environment, you see that it's uh, like the short words that it means. Try to close the small structures. Try to take Why? Then we need to hear how rough the world and the main diagnostic very important for us during this is the pain the patient has when the wire touches the inner wall, which is not the case in monkeys. In these cases, you get that rough feeling, you go through plus pain, and you say, No, I stop. There's no meaning. I don't pay you. If you have the IC market, So it's not so common, but it's very important to have our service. For the patient, it works. There are new drugs for this, but at the end, I don't know if you will take the new liver uh, or the new liver will get the disease uh, again. So for the patient, this patient is very, very important. So our centers are quite lacking because we are the referral of the referral center in 24 or 5 extensions from Friday. So we saw a lot of cases, about more than 200 uh, per year. So that is quite common. But since the outcome is on uh, power, like the cervicalites in the front, have become more frequent. Also, this is that uh, alteration on the is more frequent because now we have a lot of young guys. With the uh, chronicities and the final steps of the And in our position, we have a bit of what something is changing because they think that uh, the autoimmune disease is stuck first in the liver and then reach the, the bowel. So now we are really focused in trying some of the drugs and the bowel machine. So, first of all, our bowel information. So, they have now uh, recovering themselves. Uh, so the history of our medicine is just that it's not changing. It's not frequent, but we are starting from some plus to bring them because we now we have the treatment to bring the documentation and uh, and from clear point of view I suggest when it's possible in the end of the year of the stage just to decide if you have to bring one really uh, or one segment of the liver and improve the quality of life in your stage. Because we observe that some uh, area of the BNP are dilated, like the words, and then in the other part of the liver, we have dilation that we don't see. And this is uh, then this approach works also in uh, active pancreatitis. Uh, we don't have experience, but we are starting to do this. Those patients with active polycystitis or with active pancreatitis due to our stones, it seems that uh, during the MRI, we have a little phase. The the bigger the area with stones do not exclude the kind of agent, and so it should be treated. This could be a different option or a or advice that uh, uh, our business records can offer to the other clinician. So now we suggest the other that we just decide how to manage the patient. So I don't know if they are available in the US. So in this case, and we will uh, set up a lot that can bring it with a conversation and take that back to all the people who are 
the sequences, plus the light the formation and the total division, while in the side of the treatment or the degree the patient you can do the chemical degree with one phaser, but you should wait more than 20 minutes before the end of the discussion. But the should be made. Yeah, yeah, so it's a really good yes. Maybe until two hours or even uh in our sense of sorry we use the treatment, so they will be and uh the data is just the practice yeah, more to wait more. Yes, it's different from cigarettes and cigarettes. So we have to wait for just to differentiate functional services different from functional services. So this would be my advice to the students. Yeah. Very important point. Yeah. And in all many cases of chronic in the risk, but I think that they are increasing likely. Oh, yes, never did it on the point of view. Slightly increasing, yeah. increase, but still increasing. So, both of this is really every other disease is increasing in the prevalence. Is there any other question or comment? <laughs> so, everything was excellent. Thank you. If you need a break, we can offer a break. I don't know, we can go on. Thank you, thank you very much. So the second talk is uh, the imaging of uh, mass, yeah. which is also a very important topic. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you again. Let's start in uh, defining the radiological imaging of a gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine neuro tumor. Uh, they are a rare neoplasm that derived from the proliferation of cells that present both characteristic of nervous system and endocrine phenotype. And this kind of cell are located all around our body, and so the tumor may develop in different organs. And for this reason, usually we distinguish the neuroendocrine tumor in tumors deriving from the gastroenteropancreatic tract and the non-gastroenteropancreatic tumor. But today we will focus our attention on gastroenteropancreatic tract that achieve almost the 60% uh, of cases. And the second typical location is the bronchopulmonary system. Regarding the gastrointestinal localization, the small bowel is the typical site of this kind of tumor. And especially uh, the last tract, the distal ileum, is the typical site of the neuro endocrine tumor. That will be important in the next slide, just to decide which kind of protocol we should use to make the correct diagnosis. Regarding the neuroendocrine tumor, something that must be highlighted is the, from clinical perspective, the patient may have a functional syndrome, so we talk about the functional neuroendocrine tumor, and non-functional endocrine tumor. Why this is so important from a radiological point of view? Because in this case, in case of a non-functional tumor, the radiology physician make the diagnosis, make the staging, and then the clinician will confirm the diagnosis through the evaluation of uh, hormone secretion. While in the functional case, we have only to stage the disease that manifests itself due to an hyperhormone secretion, like the carcinoid syndrome, the insulinoma, or Zollinger and Ellison syndrome, characterized by multiple uh, ulcerative alteration along the bowel. So in the neuro endocrine tumor, we have a really important role, especially for the diagnosis. And in the diagnosis, when we try to make the diagnosis, we should first uh, localize the lesion. We should evaluate the relationship of lesion with other uh, surrounding organ we should rule out the presence of distant metastasis in order to offer information for the possible therapeutic treatment or for surgical treatment. And also in this case, the radiology has a main role during the follow-up in order to evaluate the possibility of any disease recurrence. From the diagnostic point of view, we have uh, several possibilities. We have the morphological imaging with non-invasive approach, we have the functional imaging, again, with non-invasive approach. And finally, we have the invasive procedure that are more common in the endoscopic world. Regarding the morphological imaging, we could uh, use abdominal ultrasound, contrast-enhanced abdominal CT, 
MRI of the abdomen and more frequent when we should rule out the small bowel localization, the entero CT or entero MRI are really fundamental. Regarding the functional imaging, usually the most important technique are the PET CT study or the imaging through nuclear medicine physician with the somatostatin target receptor. While with MRI, you can take the advantage of the diffusion of weighted sequences as functional technique. Well, let's start with abdominal ultrasound. That is a technique that is quite uh, available all around of the world and in different departments. It has a really low cost, can be uh, performed in a fast way, and do not, do not offer, does not offer any ionizing radiation. Unfortunately, as already said in the previous presentation, it is strictly related to the experience of the operator. And in most of the cases, especially in evaluation of pancreatic lesion, we, have, we can achieve some difficulties in recognizing and evaluating the body and the tail of pancreas. For this reason, the sensitivity of this technique is really low, ranging from 13 to 70 or to 27% of cases. In case of neoplastic lesion, it usually appears as hyperechoic mass surrounded by hyperechoic hair. The most important technique to make the correct diagnosis of the neuroendocrine tumor and in general for the evaluation of abdominal pathological condition is the CT study with contrast agent administration. Because again, this technique is really widely available, but it has a really high spatial resolution, allows a really fast acquisition. And since it is a multiplanar technique, we could reconstruct the images in different plane. And so we can better evaluate the relationship of the tumor with a different vessel or to highlight any possible complication derived from the mass effect created by tumor. And again, how we should perform the correct examination. First, the unenhanced CT scan, it's really mandatory because most of the neuroendocrine tumor are characterized by the presence of calcification and hemorrhage. Second, most important contrastographic phase is the arterial phase because in the arterial phase, the lesion are characterized by hypervascular enhancement due to their uh, neuroendocrine uh, phenotypic alteration. So they lose blood and lose nutrients. And finally, we should evaluate also the portal middle space in order to highlight any possible metastasis and relationship with the different vein. But in those patients in which we have the suspicion of small bowel neoplastic neuroendocrine tumor, we should perform the enterocity study that means that we must dilate uh, the small bowel through the uh, administration of oral contrast solution, a water solution. In our institution, we usually uh, offer the patient 1.5 liter of oral solution that must be administered in a fractionated way. Each uh, uh, 40 minutes, we give the patient 50 uh, half liter of water solution. And then the acquisition must be done in the prone position in order to increase the pressure inside the bowel wall. And when we look at the images, we would be able to recognize, like in this case, this polypoid mass inside the middle tract of uh, the small bowel associated with multiple lymph nodes and can be clearly evident uh, after uh, the bowel distension. Because if the lesion is quite small, it's difficult to differentiate the normal enhancement of the bowel wall from a plastic condition. Regarding the abdominal MRI, it is another good uh, diagnostic opportunity, good uh, technique to make the correct diagnosis, because again, it has a really high contrast resolution. It allows us to uh, obtain a multiplanar acquisition. And again, with high spatial resolution without offering any ionizing radiation, which are, uh, but unfortunately, this technique is quite expensive and we have a low availability all around the world. And unfortunately, the examination list uh, duration is about 20 minutes at least. 
So it means that we uh, deserve a good cooperation of the patient before uh, spend the money and make this kind of examination. When we should use the abdominal MRI, mainly in those inconclusive cases at CT examination or when we have to screen young patient due to a several risk factor. How can we recognize the lesion? In line with other neoplastic condition, uh, usually the neoplastic mass is hypointense T1, is likely hypointense on T2 weighted sequences, and after the contrast agent administration, the behavior is in line with that of CT scan. So the lesions are characterized by marked enhancement during the arterial phase. Again, if we are if we have to rule out any small bowel neoplastic condition, we should perform the entero MRI. Let me show a typical example of a huge mass on, uh, uh, on the body of the pancreas, characterized by slightly higher intensity signal on T2 and higher intensity on T1. What is really interesting in neuroendocrine tumor is that they can be solid, uh, they can manifest like a solid mass or as a cystic mass. And so, again, the magnetic resonance imaging could be the best technique to differentiate the cystic nature of this neuro neuroendocrine condition because we could appreciate the homogeneous high hyperintensity on T2, presence of septum, and the area of enhancing the nodular lesion inside the cystic component in line with the degeneration and uh, final correct diagnosis. The enter MRI offers the same information in line with NPCT. So the, pro the acquisition protocol is the same. Again, we should use 1.5 liters of water solution. But in those patients that undergo MRI more than CT, we should use the spasmolytic drugs in order to reduce the artifacts due to the bowel movement that are not present usually when we perform the CT scan. And again, let me show a case from our series. In this case, we are not able to obtain a really good distension of the small bowel wall, but due to the hypo-intensity and due to the dilation of the lumen, we are able to recognize this hypervascular polypoid mass in the distal tract of the ileum. <coughs> well, when we look at the neuroendocrine tumor, related to the gastroenteropancreatic localization, we should make a distinction between the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and the extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. As already said, most of the neuroendocrine tumor are gastrointestinal, and most of them are localized in the distal ileum. So we should perform in most of cases the entero CT or entero MRI in order to better evaluate the wall of the small uh, of the of the bowel. Another important issue is that in most of the cases, still 40% of cases, the neuroendocrine tumor are multifocal. So uh, don't be relaxed after you find out only one tumor. You should rule out the presence of other possible uh, location inside the small bowel. And how can the lesion can appear? They may manifest like a small lesion of the submucosa, like an ulcerated intraluminal lesion, the most challenging one, while the most frequent one are the polypoid mass with or without a circumferential thickening. Moreover, it's quite common in everyday clinical practice, the neuroendocrine tumor may cause a look kicking and a look occlusion. And in most of the cases in the emergency department, we make the diagnosis in a non-functional endocrine tumor that have caused an occlusion, especially in the elderly patients. And again, the most important characteristic is the early and marked contrast enhancement. Now I'm showing you one uh, case from our series in which the lesion is localized in the jejunum, so it's not so typical, but it's characterized by hyper enhancement in arterial phase, hyper enhancement also in portal venous phase, and through the multiplanar reformatted images, we are able to highlight the relationship with the bowel itself and with the extra intestinal uh, organ, like the fat, like vessel, and we could highlight the presence of any possible lymph nodes.
This is one of the, our most challenging cases in which the lesion is characterized is a flattened lesion characterized by focal ulceration. In this case, if we do not use or we do not perform the dilation of the small bowel, it's quite impossible to make the correct diagnosis. So please, I suggest you to uh, dilate the small bowel in all of the cases suspected for neuroendocrine tumor. Again, another example of a patient with a huge uh, neuroplastic mass inside the medium tract of the small bowel, and again characterized by polypoid aspect with ulceration and the association of multiple lymph nodes on surrounding mesenteric parts. Another typical manifestation of neuroendocrine tumor outside from pancreas is the desmoplastic reaction and the mesenteric mass. In most of the cases, we do the diagnosis of the neuroendocrine tumor due to the presence of a mesenteric mass that is characterized by well-defined mass with soft tissue density, in which we are able to recognize the intralegional calcification and the irregular margin, called the speculation, that are really, really common. And again, if you do a uh, CT in emergency condition and you find a soft tissue mass in the mesenteric factor, please rule out the presence of any mass inside the small bowel. Moreover, another typical sign of patient with mesenteric mass due to a neuroendocrine tumor is the radiating stranding that is a desmoplastic condition and desmoplastic reaction of this soft tissue. These are two different cases in which we are able to recognize this huge mass in mesenteric factor. Here we can appreciate a high amount of tiny calcification, the radiated stranding, the homogeneity of a uh, surrounding factor, and the neoplastic lesion inside the small bubble. This is another example of a patient with multiple neuroendocrine tumor along all of the different tracts of the small bubble. Another example of typical manifestation of the mesenteric mass with multiple calcification, stranding of the fat sap, and radiating stranding, quite typical for localization of the neuroendocrine tumor. And again, when we look at this uh, condition, we also do evaluate the vessel that can be involved in the rectory way, that, because the tumor may encase and envelop the vessel, or the uh, production and uh, the secretion of neuroendocrine substances may cause an elastic sclerosis of the vessel that become hardening and stiffening. And let me show an example of a huge lymphoma of the body and pancreas, uh, of uh, the body and tail of pancreas that involve the origins of both celiac tract and mesenteric uh, superior mesenteric artery. The neuroendocrine uh, tumor outside the pancreas may cause pancreatic metastasis, like in this example in which we are able to recognize the desmoplastic mass, multiple polypoid mass inside the small bowel, and presence of multiple metastatic lesion inside the pancreas, in the body, and in the head region. But this tumor may metastasize also inside the liver parenchyma, and again, the neoplastic lesion presents the same behavior of the primary tumor, so hypervascularization during the third phase associated with the necrotic component in the central portion. In this case, I'm showing you a typical case of a neuroendocrine that uh, developed inside the, inside the stomach. We are able to recognize a high amount of lymph nodes with a really uh, huge dimension, more than two centimeters in short axis, and high amount of uh, neuroplastic localization along of the liver. Well, let's move to the pancreatic localization of neuroendocrine tumor. And again, it is important to distinguish the functional tumor from non-functional tumor. Usually, the functional tumor may have a small dimension when we do the diagnosis because they create a typical syndrome. And so we have to rule out the presence and we make the diagnosis at early stage. 
Usually we can appreciate a well-defined mass with the hypervascular pattern, while in case of non-functional tumor, we are able to rule out or to recognize the lesion when they has a really <coughs> huge dimension, more than four centimeters. And obviously being a, a so uh, being bigger this lesion, if compared to functional one, we could observe the cystic degeneration and intralesional necrosis. Let's move to the typical characteristic of uh, this alteration. Again, the pancreatic uh, uh, neoplastic condition may manifest the calcification. The calcification represents a, a consequence of multiple hemorrhage inside the neoplastic tumor because the granulocyte reached this region. And when the granulocyte died, they accumulate calcium inside. And for this reason, in the more aggressive tumor, we have more hemorrhage and more calcification. In case of huge lesion, we should uh, evaluate the relationship mainly with arterial vessel when we are in front of pancreatic localization. And the most important sign to make the correct differential diagnosis with adenocarcinoma is the non-dilation of the main pancreatic duct. So in neuroendocrine tumor, we do not have any dilation, while in case of pancreatic adenocarcinoma, a typical sign is the dilation of pancreatic duct. And again, in this case, I'm showing you a huge mass in the body of pancreas, characterized by uh, calcification, hypervascular enhancement, a little bit dishomogeneous in arterial phase, that is still present, still remain evident also in portal venous phase, because the lesion is brighter than surrounding uh, pancreatic parenchyma, and maintains the hypervascularity also <clears throat> in the delayed phase. And these are the multiplanar reformatted images in coral plane. Other possible manifestation of neuroendocrine tumor is the mixed appearance in which you are able to appreciate the cystic component and the solid component in one lesion. So both present and both are characterized from hypervascular nature, so hyper in the arterial phase, hyper dense also in portal venous phase, surrounded by cystic component. And in this case, we are able to appreciate also the inhomogeneity of surrounding fat and the relationship with uh, mesenteric, with the superior mesenteric vein that was quite involved by the plastic lesion. Another possible appearance is the typical solid mass characterized by hyperenhancement again in arterial phase and hyperenhancement in portal venous phase. In this case, uh, this patient has also a huge uh, diverticulum of the horizontal tract of the duodenum. So the patient has a symptom like biliary stasis and jaundice due to this huge uh, uh, diverticulus. And we incidentally found out, we found out uh, this neuroendocrine tumor. So it was again an incidental lesion, like in this case, that was referred to our emergency department to a really a, a specific symptom like abdominal pain, underwent a multiple phase CT scan, and we find out this small hypervascular neoplastic alteration in the head of pancreas. Again, the pancreatic neoplastic lesion may cause liver metastasis, and also in this case, the enhancement is in line with the primary tumor, so the lesions are uh, mainly characterized by early marked enhancement, can be localized in both of the liver lobe, and can be evident also in portal venous veins. Regarding the localization inside the pancreatic gland, we should make some differential diagnosis with the three different entities that are quite common inside the uh, parenchyma gland, uh, pancreatic gland, represented by the serous cystadenoma, hypervascular metastasis, and intrapancreatic accessory spleen. Well, the cystus adenoma is a cystic lesion, but in those cases of patients with microcystic appearance, the septa can be characterized by hyperenhancement, and so uh, we should consider the differential diagnosis with neuroendocrine tumor. How can we do the correct diagnosis? In those cases, we will suggest to perform the MRI because the MRI is a really sensitive 
to fluid, and so we can recognize the high amount of small multiple cysts. In case of hypervascular metastasis, we should uh, keep in mind the history of patient to make the correct diagnosis. In this case, the patient has a previous history of a surgical resection of left kidney due to a kidney tumor. It has a relapse of disease in the control lateral kidney, and now we are able to recognize multiple tiny hypervascular metastases along all of the pancreas. Finally, intrahepatic accessory spleen that are quite common finding in everyday clinical practice. And how we do the correct diagnosis, usually we look at the enhancement in the different contrastographic phase. And the enhancement is similar to, the, to that of spleen in all, sorry, all the, all the contrastographic phase. Let me show another case from our series of the huge serous cystic adenoma with microcystic appearance that are not recognizable the microcyst in the arterial phase, but we are able to appreciate the hyper enhancement of the different septum during the arterial phase. How can we do the diagnosis if we do not have the availability of MRI? Usually the cystic seroadenoma has a wash in in arterial phase and wash out in portal venous phase. While the neuroendocrine tumor are hypervascularized in arterial phase, in portal venous phase, and mostly also in the late phase. And this is a typical example of we can do the make correct diagnosis. This is a hyper enhancement of this solid mass. But if we try to evaluate the same patient on MR, we can recognize the fluid content of this rounding lesion. So this is not a neuroendocrine tumor, but this is a serous cystus. Uh, system the norm. And again, the magnetic resonance imaging is really useful also to make the correct diagnosis of intrapancreatic accessory spleen because the intensity signal is the same of spleen in all of the in all of the sequences and also in the diffusion weighted sequences. And obviously, if we use the contrast agent, we have the same behavior in terms of enhancement. Which are the characteristics of neuroendocrine tumor at MR? Again, since we are in front to neoplastic condition, the lesion are slightly hyperintense on T1. They are slightly hyperintense on T2-weighted sequences. The contrast enhancement is in line with CT, so early and marked hyperenhancement on arterial phase. And if we use the DWI sequences, uh, we are able to appreciate the restriction of signal intensity. This was a case of patient with uh, fatty degeneration of pancreas that is not recognizable anymore. On T1 weighted images, we are able to appreciate this rounding hyperintense mass that is slightly hyperintense on T2 weighted with fat suppression. And after the contrast agent administration, we can appreciate the hypervascular nature of that lesion that is still present also in portal venous space. And again, if we try to use the DWI sequences, we can highlight immediately the uh, neoplastic alteration. Another example of patient with a mixed structure of this mass, characterized by soft tissue, fibrotic components, hyperintense before any contrast agent administration, characterized by hypervascular nature in arterial phase, maintaining the uh, hyper enhancement also in portal venous phase. So the, uh, the hyper enhancement during the different contrastographic phase is really specific for the neuroendocrine zoom, both for, for cystic one and for solid one. Again, we should recognize the metastatic alteration inside of the liver also with MRI. We are able to appreciate a rounding, multiple run, uh, alteration in both liver segment that are hyperintense on the T1 weighted sequences, hyperenhancement on arterial phase, and some of them may have a necrotic component inside. Another example of metastatic lesion that present some cystic component in line with the primary tumor that are really evident in the T2 weighted sequences, both with and without fat saturation. And again, after the contrast agent administration, also, the cystic neuroendocrine metastasis present an hypervascularization in arterial phase 
a necrotic component in portal venous space. Well, this patient must be followed. The best treatment for this patient is the surgical resection. But again, now we have some uh, med, uh, some drugs to treat those patients, especially the medical treatment is really focused on control the symptoms related to the secretion of the hormone. And for this reason, the patient deserves several follow-up. The follow-up is not required in those cases of non-functional neuroendocrine tumor with diameter of less than two centimeters, while the follow-up is mandatory in those patients with functional neuroendocrine tumor. And we suggest to use uh, the same technique that we use to make the correct diagnosis during the first step. And again, I would like to thank you for the kind attention. The very comprehensive overview of the neuroendocrine tumor. They are uh, discovered in increasing frequency last, uh, in the last decade, at least in the last decade. So you have also you have mentioned everything, but allow me to, to point out some some uh, something that should be remembered. Although it seems easy to diagnose because of the arterial enhancement, uh, because of the calcification or the hemorrhage, uh, they, they present a, a very very different uh, forms of tumor. Uh, some of them are uh, really cystic, so you 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 may think that you are dealing with the cyst. Or with the cystic lesion, <laughs> and these tumors sometimes are very, very aggressive. So uh, the, the, you need to be uh, extremely careful for that, especially for the cystic lesion. Um, sometimes the tumors in the bowel are, are tiny; you, you may not find them. Yeah. So you, you probably see the uh, the lymph node metastasis in the in the surgery. And if you see some big nodes that are not uh, round and clear and have some, uh, some stranding in the surrounding part, you should consider that maybe uh, a, newer or a small or a tiny tumor that is not, uh, is not recognized. And of course, and also the rectum is it's a very common site of those type of tumors. Although rectum is easily accessible by the gastrologist, but you should consider those tumors uh, there. Uh, sometimes they are big when they are big, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to, to find the, the organ of origin, but as we told, mostly you have to consider the bowel fibers. Um, and it, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a type of tumor that every embryo should be aware. I agree. Uh, especially uh, when you're you are in your city, you look at the liver and you see some metastasis heart paper enhancing, you should consider. Fortunately, the, the, the frequency is increasing. I don't, I don't I know why. Because we do more examination, so we find out more. Sometimes they, they left, uh, yes. they consider the other types of drugs. Because they are not functional, and so maybe you don't know yeah. about the brain. Okay, so it's a, it's a, any question or, or comment from the people who are are watching us or from the people that are trying to be here? No. Well, that's the special interest for this kind of people, especially the people who are doing So I don't ask for that, it's a bit important. Yeah, very important that we have to be And then we go to the rest of the show. Very nice feeling. So I swear. But we have the same kit sometimes stabilized also by perhaps then
There were the first uh, two in the river, one in the river. They asked us to demobilize that river definition. Beautiful job. That patient uh, that also. Uh, And in the follow up, all three words. So we didn't know. Was it because of our organization in the liver? That's why you're. <laughs> but then why also? Or it was that which eliminated everything. So it could be, it could be as well. Both therapies can be. Any other question or comments? So, thank you so thank much. You so much. Once again, yes. very didactic, both uh, spectacular, but very didactic for us, very useful for everyone. Thank you very much.